This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Earlier this month, Chicago City Council approved a $5.5 million reparations fund for victims of police torture. More than 200 people, most of them African American, were tortured under the reign of Chicago Police Commander John Burge from 1972 to 91. Tactics included electric shocks and suffocation. The reparations package will provide free city college tuition for victims and relatives, counseling services, a memorial to victims, inclusion of Burge actions in the school curriculum, and a formal apology. Many torture victims were present when the Chicago City Council unanimously approved the reparations package last Thursday. They were recognized by Chicago Alderman Joe Moreno. We have some victims of torture here today and their families, and if they would rise when I call their names, Daryl Cannon, Anthony Holmes, Prince Mundutti, Mirren Diggins, Mark Clemens. Ronnie Kitchen, Marvin Reeves, Stanley Rice, Gregory Banks, Willie Porch, Lindsey Smith, George Powell, Ollie Hammonds, Elsie Riley, Mary Johnson, who's a mother of torture survivor Michael Johnson, Betha Escamilla, mother of torture survivor Nick Escamilla, and Carolyn Johnson, the mother of torture survivor Marcus Wiggins. Thank you for your ch your leadership. Thank you for continuing to fight, even though you out here you're, you've been out. You're fighting for those that are still in and for those that are still suffering. Thank you so much. Chicago Mayor Rahm Emanuel then apologized to the police torture victims and their survivors and thanked them for their efforts to demand justice. The stain cannot be removed from our history of our city, but it can be used as a lesson of what not to do and the responsibility that all of us have. For more, we go to Chicago, where we're joined by two guests. Flint Taylor's founding partner of the People's Law Office for more than 25 years. He's represented survivors of police torture, including Daryl Cannon, who also joins us. Police tortured Daryl in 1983 and forced him to confess to a murder he didn't commit. He spent more than 20 years in prison, but after a hearing on his tortured confession, prosecutors dismissed his case in 2004. He was released three years later. Since then, he's focused on the roughly 20 men tortured during the John Burge era who remain behind bars. We welcome both of you back to Democracy Now! Uh, Darrell Cannon, can you talk about <clears throat> being in the city council chamber, the Chicago city council chamber, um, as you were recognized and thanked by a city council member as they voted on a police torture fund of, what was it, five and a half million dollars? Correct. Can you talk about what happened to you? Uh, November the 2nd, 1983, about 15 all-white detectives uh, invaded my apartment, um, terrorized me, my common-law wife, and my cat. And during that day, um, through, uh, I was tortured in despicable ways, from them using um, electric caliprol to uh, shock me on my genitals and in my mouth. Uh, they tried to hang me by my handcuffs, which was cuffed behind my back. And they tried to play a game of Russian roulette on me with a shotgun, and they ended up chipping my two front teeth and splitting my upper lip. And then what happened? Uh, from there, by the time they finished with me that evening, uh, I was ready to say that my mother committed a crime if they told me that was the case. Uh, the type of things that they did to me, I have never in my life uh, experienced and I'll never in my life forget. Uh, it was something that uh, you couldn't even conjure up in a, in a horror movie, uh, because you don't think that Chicago police officers uh, would stoop this low in trying to obtain a confession. It didn't matter whether or not I was guilty or innocent. In their minds, any time they pick a black man up, he's guilty. Flint Taylor, you've represented Daryl Cannon, as well as other people who were the victim of police torture. Um, What—how was this $5.5 million fund arrived at, and what did it take for you to get the City Council of Chicago and the mayor, Rahm Emanuel, to talk about this as a police torture fund? 
Well, there's a, tr a long history, as you mentioned, uh, of fighting against police torture in the city, starting decades ago. And uh, there's been uh, tremendous movements, uh, generational, intergenerational movements, uh, interracial movements uh, that have fought first to get Burge fired many years ago, later to get him indicted uh, in 2008 for perjury and obstruction of justice and to get him convicted and sent to the penitentiary, a federal penitentiary. And now, this particular movement was a wonderful coming together of young people, older people, uh, an organization called uh, the Torture Justice Memorials, um, and uh, other young organizations, Black Lives Matter, We, we Charge Genocide. Uh, and all of that came together. Uh, politically, uh, to deal with aldermen, to deal with demonstrations, to, to marches. There was a great uh, uh, up, uh, up, not uprising, but uh, an uplifting experience uh, that ultimately led in the middle of, of uh, what appeared to be a tough uh, election uh, cycle to the uh, mayor and his people and, and the majority of aldermen uh, dealing with this issue uh, some decades after the torture took place. Uh, and that, that really is the, the, uh, the reason that uh, we were successful in getting this uh, unique and historic reparations package. To answer uh, your other question, uh, there are about 55 living men, 55 or 65, we estimate, uh, who were tortured who uh, will be eligible for the reparations. Uh, we felt that uh, symbolically and in a real way that uh, $100,000 per person would be something that would be meaningful, uh, although certainly uh, does not fully compensate anyone for being tortured. Uh, but it, it, there was no legal recourse for these men. The statute of limitations had run out. So the entire package, as you mentioned, not only the, uh, the money, but the, but the uh, services, psychological counseling for family members and the men who have been tortured, uh, the education, uh, not only for the men, but in the public schools, to have it taught, uh, to have a narrative, the narrative we've been fighting for about police torture all these years that was disbelieved and laughed at and denigrated in the same way uh, Home and Square is, is, is denigrated and laughed at by the city and the police. Uh, um, that Now the narrative has changed and will be taught in a different way. Um, former Chicago Police Commander John Burge served a short prison sentence for perjury and obstruction of justice before his release last year. Statistics compiled by your office, Flint, the People's Law Office, show Chicago has paid at least $64 million in settlements and judgments in civil rights cases related to Burge's police abuses alone. The Chicago Reader reported some of Burge's techniques may have been learned in Vietnam, where he served as a military policeman. How long did John Burge serve? And, Daryl Cannon, did you you meet him at any point um, when you were being beaten and tortured? Uh, no, ma'am. I didn't personally meet him. He was at the station that day, and he assigned his own personal uh, hand-picked soldiers uh, to come and get me. Uh, Peter Dignett, the most vicious detective out of all of them. Uh, he's the one that did all the um, uh, announcing of John Burge. Anytime they did a fundraiser, um, he took him to his house on holidays and fed him with his family and et cetera. So far as I'm concerned, he wasn't directly there, but indirectly, oh, yes, ma'am, he was there. Mm. And Darrell Cannon, will you benefit from this $5.5 million police torture fund? Uh, yes, ma'am. But the thing that, that, that I'm most um, proud of is the fact that the curriculums in schools will be taught now from eighth grade through tenth grade, something that has never been done in the history of, the, of America. And because of this, um, I play a small role in, in trying to bring positive change uh, to the police department, and I'll continue to work on behalf of those who are still in prison. Now, you had been offered money before, is that right, in a settlement? Yes, ma'am. How much? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And, I, well, we can't disclose exactly how much, but let's say it was over a million. Huh. But I refused to uh, accept it 
um, because, Father, I was concerned this was hush-up money for me to go away, to be quiet, and to speak no more about it. But the picture has always been bigger than Daryl Cannon. You know, what about the other Daryl Cannons who were not as fortunate as I was to to have a supporting system on the streets, as well as to have competent lawyers that stood with me uh, through decades in litigation, and we finally achieved the victories that we wanted on that level. But as I said before, the case is not over with. The glass is only half full. And those other Darrells, Darrell Cannon, um, those that are still in prison, what is happening oh, yes, with them? Oh, yes, ma'am. Uh, we're hoping now that um, the, the litigation that has been slowly dragging out through the judicial system will now be stepped up, seeing how uh, the city council, as well as the mayor, has come to grips with this horrible tragedy. I'm hoping that the judicial system will also take the leading role and speed up uh, all the hearings into the police brutality for those that are still in prison, and in doing so, let the evidence speak for itself. If the evidence shows that these sadistic, vicious individuals posing as cops did, in fact, torture them, then give all of those men new trials in front of a fair and impartial judge. We have 30 seconds, Flint Taylor. Do you see that happening? And overall, do you see what's happened in Chicago as a model for other cities? It's definitely a model, not only for other cities, uh, but all, all across the world, I would think, that it happened here in Chicago. Uh, that if there are movements to take it to other cities, as we see there are across the, the country, that they can demand the same kind of things that the movement here demanded. Uh, in terms of hearings, we're very hopeful that people who are still in prison after all these years and decades will get fair hearings, and the judge has ordered that they be appointed lawyers to look into their cases and to bring them back to court. So we are hopeful on both fronts. But the, the message has to, has to get out as you are taking it to the country for us uh, so that others can see the example set here and that re reparations can be a word uh, that is broad and, and accepted across this country when it comes to police violence and police brutality. Attorney Flint Teller, I want to thank you for being with us, one of the founding partners of People's Law Office in Chicago, and Daryl Cannon, tortured by Chicago police, now out fighting for those who remain in prison. Person. This is Democracy Now! When we come back, upstate New York, there's a struggle going on. We'll speak with a filmmaker, Josh Fox, who is one of 20 people arrested this week at Seneca Lake. Stay with us.